quite nice piece of music. Thank you. Okay. So I think we might, we might get started. There's some more people to join us, but they'll just have to um, catch up. But thank you all for joining us. I'm Vicky Bachelard. Um, I work in the sustainability team at Waverley Council, and um, we have a, a webinar this evening on um, attracting small birds to your garden and creating happy patches in your garden. Um, so before I introduce you to Renee, who's our presenter this evening, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Bidigal and Gadigal people who traditionally occupied the Sydney coastal area, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders so our presenter this evening is Renee Furster-Levy. She's an ecologist and educator, and she's passionate about wildlife and creating habitat to improve biodiversity. And as you will see, she loves engaging people with her, and her love of field work. She's been involved with the Bird Life Australia for many years, including in the programs Birds in Backyards, Birds in Schools, and Budding Bird Earth. Renee guides bird walks, bird walks and conducts workshops and does frequent bird surveys across our, across our area in the eastern suburbs. Um, she's also an eastern suburbs local, so she's got a fair idea of what species are where and importantly what species are missing as well. And she's identified an ongoing loss of small birds in the area. Um, she delights in our precious spots which spots which still have good diversity in them and she aims to encourage people to reconnect with them and recreate them in their gardens. So I'm going to pass over to Renee in a minute. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, if you can use the chat function to type them in and I will ask them to Renee either as we go along or I'll save them up till the end. <coughs> um, I sent out a couple of emails with some resources and some links in them, so hopefully you got those, and so you can go after the meeting and go and refer to some of the things that Renee has talked about. Um, oh, we did say the meeting was an hour long, Renee's got quite a lot to tell you, so it might go a little over that, so I hope you can stay with us until the end, but we'll try and wrap it up. Okay, Renee, I'm going to pass over to you now if you'd like to share your screen. Right. Looking, looks good. Renee, hang on. Renee, you just, um, there we go. You keep getting muted. There we go. It says muted. I don't know why. Okay. All good now. <laughs> right. Great. So, welcome, everybody. Um, and again, I would also like to honour the Indigenous people who looked after this amazing land for so, so long. Um, and uh, we can only learn and, and try to walk in their footsteps and develop a, more, a really sensitive way of looking after our beautiful area. Um, so attracting small birds to your garden, um, we're going to cover quite a few things. Um, which birds are in our area, why small birds are becoming rare, solutions, what plants might be suitable, and other habitat elements. But along the way, I'll bring in quite a few other things, and so um, things will merge in to each other rather than strictly going in that order. I chose this um, graphic for a reason. Graphics, by definition, are very simplistic, and unfortunately, that's what's happening in our environment and in our gardens. And what I'm hoping to do is show how we can change that and how we can bring back some of the elements that are so essential for the biodiversity. So as we fly over our, our beautiful area, 
Um, this shows most, as you, all of you who are local will be familiar, so this pretty well shows most of Waverley Council, just missing a little bit up to Christensen Park, um, and some of Willara and lots of Randwick Council areas as well. Um, I won't tell you how I took this photo. This was something we used to do. <laughs> we look at it and of course we see our housing and our lovely areas and it looks quite green in between and in glimpses of the backyards. We also see these great big areas of greenery. We can see the golf course, we can see the big line is Cooper Park, beyond that is Waverley Park and just on the middle right you can just about make out Queen's Park. So all of these areas you would think, wow, we've got a lot of green. Aren't they going to be fabulous for the birds and the other wildlife? But in fact, is that the case? So how do we know what we've got? I thought, who best to ask, um, but some of the key local people in the area. Um, Waverley puts on a fabulous festival each summer called Summerama, and I had a stall there about birds, just imagine. <laughs> and so I did a straw poll. Um, using these, the, by the way, these lovely little cards are from Birds in Backyards program and if you're interested or your kids are interested, they've actually got information on the back, beautiful images on the front. So what I did was I just put them up and asked people to put a dot next to three of the common birds they see in their area. That's it, no other instructions. And as you can see, loads of people participated and maybe some of you have dots right up there too. And without I'd just like you to take a moment to have a look and see if you can see a pattern. So let's just have a listen to something lovely while we have a think. So if you manage to see a pattern, you notice that my secret, which I didn't tell anybody, was that I put all the small birds down the bottom and the big birds up the top. And lo and behold, most of the dots, which you can see, are up the top where the big birds are. Very, very few dots down the bottom. Um, and in terms of numbers, it was the rainbow lorikeet, the kookaburra, the magpie. So then you might think, oh, well, hang on a minute, it's all the big birds because they're easier to see and we know them more, but there's also the noisy miner. Okay, so the noisy miner is very noisy <laughs> and makes itself heard, but it is a much smaller bird than the others. But this gives a very clear picture, but perhaps it's not as scientific as it could be. And I didn't include all the birds and maybe not everyone knows all the birds. So let's see how we can make it a bit more scientific. So BirdLife Australia has a fabulous database called Bird Data, which anybody is free to enter and explore. You can set up a free account, but even without that, if you, it's a bit small, you might be able to see at the very top, um, there's a section called Explore. And if you see that, you can look up the most amazing things to your heart's content. You can search by many, many ways. You can search by area, by species, narrow it down by time zones. Uh, you can look at just the block of your street, or you can look at all of Australia. And you can search by, yeah, as I said, by species. So I just put in Waverley Council, since Vicky organised this. Um, and I know it's quite small, but you'll see a whole lot of dots. An orange line delineates the Waverley Council area and a whole lot of dots. Each red dot and blue dot is a survey. Um, and the blue dots just tell you they're recent, so they're within two weeks, which is great. Because if you want to know not was seen 100 years ago, or not maybe it doesn't go back that far, but you know, 50 years ago, or what was seen in two weeks' time, in the last two weeks, that gives you a lot of possibilities. Now it tells us 87 species. That's a lot of species. How, mind you, that includes all the seabirds uh, people have seen from the cliffs and so on. So we narrow it down. If we could also look at it by, um, that was by taxonomic order. So that's scientific order. You can do it by order of reporting. So if you look at the reporting rate, the top ones are rainbow lorikeet, Noisy Miner, they share the top spot at nearly 50% of surveys. The Red Wattle Bird, the Pied Currawong, and the New Holland Honey Eater is quite high. That's for another reason. And then the Magpie. So actually, it's very, very similar to the rough straw poll we did with loads and loads of people at Samarama. But um, this, there are different ways of doing bird data. 
Um, and the most scientific way is regular route or regular time as well. And so you can narrow it down to the fixed times, which is usually a 20 minute survey. Um, the one thing is, the fewer people who contribute, the less complete the data. And we are missing whole areas or time periods. And so if anybody out there is at all keen, just to give, you a, give it a try, um, I highly recommend it because it's a lot of fun and science birds, um, decision makers will benefit hugely from your input. So let's go ahead and see what changes there have been in, just in Waverley. I graphed the changes. So all years, as I said, it shows 87. So the blue line is all the species. If we take out just the terrestrial birds, the land birds, that's the, um, the green line, and the red are the small birds. So we've gone from all years down to 10 years, to three years, and to one year. And you'll see not just a decline in species, but a particular decline in the small birds. And that's very concerning. So in fact, it actually only shows six small species in the last year. Now we do have to remember the last year is not a complete year yet. Um, when I looked at it from a, a year exactly, as opposed to half of 2020, it didn't change. It was still only six small species. But there also seemed to be fewer observers in the last, from three years to one year. Um, so, as I said, the more observers, the more we'll learn. But that pattern seems to be fairly consistent. So, um, let's look at a, a known method, <laughs> which is, um, somehow there are squiggles coming across the screen, Vicky. Do you know why that might be? I'm not sure why. <laughs> Don't know where they're coming from. Okay, so... Um, oh, I thought that was you. No, no, I'm not doing the squiggles. They, <laughs> Excuse I, the squiggles, everybody. <laughs> I don't know where they're coming from. I haven't seen them before. <laughs> um, so I've been surveying for many years in the area, as Vicky mentioned, um, and Bronte Gully and the grassy area has been one of my survey sites. Uh, in an old survey system that BirdLife had from 1990 to 1993, I happened to have digitised data already. So I compared with the last three year period, 2017 to 2020. Um, and let's just look at, and we're just looking at the gully and the grass area at the moment, and only those two time periods. So it's the same story again. Um, all species blue, small species red. And basically, the gully used to have loads of fairy wrens, New Holland honey eaters, woolly wagtails, right up in the gully, and others coming through on migration, a lot of small birds coming through on migration. Um, and now there are only four small species that turn up. The superb fairy wrens do not turn up in the gully and I will be so happy to be corrected because council, many of you will know, but Waverley Council has been doing fabulous bush regeneration over many years. So on the very steep slope um, for years, I think 10, is Vicky, is it 10 years already? Um, slowly, bit by bit fabulous bush habitat has been put back. And I know that with fairy wrens in the area, there's a very high chance that they might return there. And similarly, the New Holland honey eaters and others. But here's the picture at the moment. Um, and so the story, this constant loss of small species, it is happening everywhere. And that's kind of a sad story. But the great news is that they're right nearby. Okay, so if you look at the red oval, um, it's the southern side of the park as you walk up, if you're doing the coastal walk, as you walk up, you'll suddenly notice there's a bit of bush. And if you stop for a moment, you're almost certain to see or hear fairy wrens, New Holland honey eaters and others, uh, Woody Wagtail. You might see them on the parking meter. Has anyone ever seen a blue wren on a blue parking meter? Great camouflage. And seriously, you can sometimes, this is really what happened. I was taking the photo of this little fairy wren against the backdrop of the ocean and it was just beautiful. And I didn't know where to look because all these dolphins were going past. And it's just fantastic. So we're in such a great area. Um, so here are some of the species we're talking about. And I can see that Vicky's put up a poll. So have you seen a superb fairy wren in your garden and which council are you in? Fabulous. So we'll learn a lot from that. Okay. I'll just, um, for a minute. 
Okay, so um, some of these species, um, we've got the names here as well. The New Holland honey eater I've mentioned is the top left. The superb fairy wrens, these fabulous, very iconic birds. We've got the female and then the male. The welcome swallows are doing really well. And you've probably seen them in open parks, Often you see them zooming above the fig trees in large numbers, and I suspect that's probably when the tiny little fig wasps are emerging. Um, it's fascinating how figs are uh, created and grow, all due to these tiny wasps. Um, and often the swallows will just zoom right past your feet if you're going through a park. And I suspect, again, that's because we're probably disturbing the insects. It's not just that they're coming to say hello, but it would be nice to think that. Below that, we've got the silver eyes, the woolly wagtail. Now, this is exciting. The white-browed scrub wren is a bird that most people don't see. And I knew it was in nearby Ramwick and Willara councils, but it was only a couple of weeks ago that I recorded it in Waverley for the first time in years. So that's really good news up at Dover Heights. Um, and I don't know where I was spotted, Pablo, it's vanished. But the lower ones are sadly the ones that are in trouble, and that's just a few of them. We've got this gorgeous male golden whistler at the bottom, a little honey eater, the yellow-faced honey eater. These migrate over the Blue Mountains and Central Coast in their tens of thousands in autumn. And obviously they come back too, but um, it seems to be on a broader front. Um, and people do research in the Blue Mountains and at fixed gully points. These birds seem to funnel up and through the gullies. Um, and the count, the recorders, again, using fixed methods, so it's comparable, can, can estimate these tens of thousands and then they migrate with other honey eaters and silver eyes. Then there's the very delicate Eastern Spinebill with its beautiful narrow beak and the gray fantail, relative of the willy wagtail. Uh, I wonder, so, sorry? Uh, was, is, um, you know the spotted pantelope? Uh, wouldn't that be, um, wouldn't that be um, like uh, in the nearly extinct list, like in um, Vonti because, yeah, because there's not many of them and even in other parts there's um, not many. Very good. I don't know, sorry, by the way, I don't know why the picture of the spotted paddler didn't come up, but it was there. <laughs> um, that's a very good point. So spotted paddler, it's one of the birds that I recorded in the earlier years in Bronte Gully, I think quite regularly. And, um, and I haven't for a long, long time. Um, in the bushy areas, even in nearby council areas, they're still around. So that's a really good thing. And it could be that they are in parts of Bronte, but I haven't recorded them. But obviously I haven't walked every area. The thing is, and we're gonna find out in a minute, there's one bird who chases all, all the others away, especially the smaller ones. And, um, and the spotted part alerts are really not doing well. So you're quite right, Brooke, is it? Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so we're just gonna have a little few minutes with just three of the species in a little bit more depth. Um, and here we go. If you've ever seen or heard of fairy wren. So if you hear those beautiful tiny little calls, anytime you're walking or in your garden or in a bushy area, that's fantastic, that's great news. And if you get to know those calls, as well as their alarm call, as well as their tiny contact calls, then you'll be really alert and listening and able to pick up when, when these small birds are around. Because of course it is true, we're more likely to see the bigger, more obvious, noisier birds and less likely, particularly if we're not tuned in and really, really trying and listening. Um, so on the left, we've got a female with the brown and ginger little mask and ginger beak and brown tail. Sometimes they can have a bit of a blue hint in their tail. In the middle is the male in his full breeding plumage. And on the right is a male losing it. So most of them in autumn will be losing their breeding colors. Um, now, it's funny, you think, what's that awful background behind it? Have you ever looked closely at the curb of the roadside? If you hold up your hand sideways, that's about the height of a curb. And that's the size of a fairy wren below the curb. That's how tiny they are. Isn't that beautiful? Now the picture at the bottom just looks like a whole lot of green, not very interesting, but if you look closely, you could count 
a whole lot of tiny fairy wrens and a willy wagtail. I'll give you a moment to have a look. I can see seven little fairy wrens, which is really quite unusual. And there's a willy wagtail sort of towards the left. Now that's in one of the few parts of Centennial Park that still have fairy wrens. So strangely, everyone thinks there's another great big green area, Centennial Park. Of course it's got thousands of birds, but the small birds, aside from the swallows, have pretty well vanished from the whole northern part of Centennial Park, and they're only in bits of the south. Now, why are they there? There's a bushy area and a flat grassy area. They would not be safe on the grassy area if they had no bushes to retreat into. Um, so more about that later. Here's, here's a male fully in its eclipse plumage, just with the blue tail and the black beak. So what are their habitat needs? They need abundant tiny insects and spiders. You can see a caterpillar crawling up the side there. By the way, this male, look at the shape of its head. Can you see it's not nicely rounded like the previous one? So they have one of their amazing displays, is called, people call it the blue and black display, but it basically flattens these feathers into a shield, brings out the side ones like little mini wings on the head and does this fantastic display, which seems to only be when it's off trying to find a different female than its own regular female. So they have an amazing family uh, life. They've got a, a, a pair, a very strong pair bond, and they will often be accompanied by young from the previous um, nesting, particularly the young males. The females have to go off and find another family. And those young birds will help feed later on, later broods. They will, the female will sit on the eggs, but when they hatch, all of them will try and help the others and feed them. Um, obviously for shelter, they need dense shelter because they've got so many predators. Cats, gorgeous animals, but not native to Australia and just eating millions of native wildlife across Australia every day. Currawongs, now Pied Currawongs a native bird, it's an omnivore, elite anything. Currawongs love to eat fairy wren chicks. And I heard this figure, which I find a bit amazing. So I could be corrected, but I seem to have heard this figure that for one Currawong to raise its brood of chicks would take the equivalent of 40 little fairy wrens over a season. Now the funny thing on the right is a cuckoo. One of our many Australian cuckoo species, and this one's a very small cuckoo, which lays its eggs in other birds' nests. And it likes the ones with a little dome-shaped nest, like the fairy wren and the side entrance. And um, if the fairy wren isn't careful, it'll be raising these cuckoo chicks instead of its own. There's, um, I'll just go back to that. So there's fascinating research I'd love you to read about. We haven't got time to address it now. But um, it turns out that fairy wrens sing a particular song to the eggs while brooding just for a few days, the last few days before hatching. The chicks seem to learn this bit of song. The female will go off and teach it to the rest of the group away from the nest. When the chicks hatch, they sing the right song and they get fed. Cuckoo chicks hatch much earlier and don't have time to learn that particular song. And in some cases, I think in this particular study, about 40% of the uh, nests with cuckoo eggs were abandoned, um, with cuckoo chicks were abandoned. So quite interesting and loads to read about. They're just fabulous. Now, so the question is with all these threats and all these needs and all this habitat that they need with bushy, dense tangles and places to shelter and be safe and nest and find enough food, do you think one garden would be enough? maybe two gardens, maybe it needs three gardens in an urban area. So there was a fabulous lot of research done by Holly Parsons, who runs up the, the Birds in Backyards program I'll be referring to of BirdLife Australia. Um, and she did amazing work on fairy wrens, all aspects of their life, um, down in Wollongong. And at one stage they got radio tracks on just a few wrens to see what area they actually used. And this one female wren over five days used 27 different gardens. So that's how much they needed. Um, 
you know, one garden might have a bit of water, fresh water. Another garden might have a safe place to nest. But maybe it needs all those other ones to find enough food. They need a lot of food, particularly in the nesting season. So it's really important to think about what if, what if there were only half that number of suitable gardens? What if they had to cross a major road to get to some other good habitat? Do you know what happens when they cross roads? They're very small. If there are two bushes opposite each other or small trees, they'll go up and they'll cross up. But if there isn't, do you know what they do? They cross low. And guess what goes along roads low? Cars. So they're, you know, they've got so many challenges. It's just amazing. The other thing is to think about where we see one is very exciting. But is it doing well? Because what they need to do, I mentioned about the male going off and finding a different female. Well, the females before sunrise also go off to other territories, sometimes seven territories away to find another male and mate. And so, that, you know, the male, her male will be raising chicks from different, different um, sources, different males. Um, but what if it's narrowed down because of loss of habitat? So there may only be a tiny, tiny pocket that's suitable and they can't go off and spread. What if the young females haven't got nearby families to go into or new territories to find? And unfortunately, that's what's happening in a lot of urban areas. But the good news is we can do something about it. So let's race past the lily wagtail, which I hope some of you have seen. Gorgeous little um, birds. So they'll often be in parks. They're doing quite well in the open grass. But of course, they need trees and other things uh, shelter for nesting. Um, they eat loads of tiny insects, mosquitoes, all these small insect eaters are of course helping control the insects. If you're trying to grow veggies, they're going to help you in your veggie garden by controlling the pests as well. On the bottom left, you'll see one sitting on a nest. Can you make out what that nest is made of? It's quite grey, woven strands. So they'll use fine grasses and spider webs. So do woolly wagtails need spiders? They do. They might eat spiders, but they also need the spiders to be out and available to have enough web so that they can build their nests. So you can see how everything is, is linked. It's all interdependent. We can't really think of one in isolation. Beautiful, sweet call of the woolly wagtail. Some people think it's like sweet pretty creature, sweet pretty creature. <laughs> but also, even though they're small, they're really feisty. So particularly in the nesting season, they will fly and attack at anything. Doesn't matter how big. So down on the right, it's, it's, it's you know, doing its best to get this kookaburra to move on. And look at this, you ready? Look at that. <laughs> um, looks like it's landing or almost landing on the back of this raven. I, I get, I, Guarantee it must be nesting season. So by the way, I've got the photographer written down there. All the photos, almost all the photos in the presentation are my own, except a few which I've got the names on. Um, so predators of woolly wagtails. This was last week at Calga Reserve at Bronte. If you have a dog, and even in an off-leash area, please try to discourage it from doing this. Because that poor woolly wagtail even though it flew away and it wasn't eaten, it didn't have time to finish eating. So birds need a lot of food because they expend a lot of energy. And if they have to spend a lot of that energy escaping from you know, great big predators, they may not do so well. So the New Holland honey eater, one of our tiny, beautiful honey eaters, it mostly eats nectar, but a lot of also insects and spiders. And especially in the nesting season, the honey eaters will feed their chicks um, great protein in the form of you know, insects. Um, like all of them, they need a safe source of water with somewhere to escape to nearby, somewhere safe, some shelter, and, and um, the nest site. So here you can see on the bottom right, it's feeding on a eucalypt, and on the bottom left, on these tiny little flowers, which I'll mention later, they're called kunzia or tick bush, kunzia ambigua. Um, it's one of these plants where you may not grow it for the flowers you think, but even though they're small, they're like little tiny white puffballs, that bush, when it's flowering, has the most heavenly scent. It's just beautiful. So 
New Holland honey eaters are fairly noisy. And like many birds, there's a range of calls, of course. Chip, chip, and sometimes you get a whole lot. Nine at once will suddenly turn up in one spot and all scream and then off they'll go in different directions. Um, on the bottom left now, you, can you just make out a nest nestled in the lamandra? So that's the mat rush that's planted a lot, um, which is a fabulous habitat plant. This was actually right next to the coastal track. I could have touched it. And there was one egg in it. You can't quite see it. It's hidden under there. I didn't want to move the leaves because that's, you know, you can really have a bad impact if you touch nests and things like that. So I just angled it. Um, I came back about, a, I think it was the next day or the day after, and the egg was still there, but it had been pierced by something. So probably a bird had pierced it and maybe, maybe got out as much as it could. So yeah, typical. Um, now other honey eaters, I mentioned the Eastern Spinebill on the top left. They come through our area, particularly on, on migration season. The next one is the yellow-faced honey eater that I mentioned before. The great big one is the red wattle bird. Um, the most prominent colour on the red wattle bird is yellow. <laughs> but it's not called the yellow wattle bird, that's in Tasmania. It's, it's to do with the wattles, this little red dot near its face. But if you look at its beak, it is covered in orange dots. And that's pollen. So the honey eaters are crucial for the plants. We know that the honey eaters need the plants for food and the plants attract the insects that are also their food, but it goes the other way around too. The plants need the birds as pollinators and equally small mammals can be pollinators, the bats as well. And other, you know, it's really, really important and insects, of course. Can one bird, one little honey eater influence many others? So then I'm sure some of you have seen this bird, the noisy miner in typical screaming fashion, screaming at something that it wants out of its area. So let's look at the impact that one species can have on all the others. So the Birds in Backyards program I've mentioned, they've done a lot of research over the years. They, this was uh, 2000, I think, in the year 2000. They had about 900 volunteers giving information on their gardens, all aspects, whether it was native, whether they had hard surfaces, whether they had um, mostly introduced plants, all sorts of aspects, whether there was water, cats, dogs, all of it. The biggest single difference was the presence or absence of noisy miners. So here I've got the small species across the top with the names across the bottom. Um, I know they're, they're quite small, but um, so there's a superb fairy wren, red browed finch, eastern spinebill, silver eye, yellow robin, New Holland honey eater, and woody wagtail. The blue bar is in gardens where there were no noisy miners, and the red bar is in gardens with noisy miners. And in every case, there were far fewer of those small birds. Now, the noisy miner is a native bird, the native honey eater. But only about 35 years ago was when they started coming into Sydney and many other urban and rural, semi-rural areas. Because I think what's happened is they love, what, what's perfect for them is I call it two-dimensional. So, you know, flat grass with a few trees and lots of food around. Um, and as we simplified our urban areas and took out a lot of the dense undergrowth and built more and developed more, et cetera, et cetera, the habitat just became more and more perfect for them. We also, so around the 70s, I think, was the first time people started thinking, oh, let's plant native plants. So lots of wonderful hybrids came up, including things like the great big grevilleas that, that gave, give a wonderful display. Loads of people planted beautiful bottle brushes and grevilleas, and they were hybridised so they would flower much of the year very profusely. Now, that's lovely for looking at, but the problem is if a noisy miner has a choice, it will defend those territories against anything else and exclude nearly every other bird from those great food sources that are giving them nectar most of the year. So let's move on. Here's the same map again, and I've put little blue icons where we know the fairy wrens still are. I've got a couple of question marks. I've got a little one in the window of the plane, and that's not a mistake, that's actually referring, can you see on the far right? That's referring to the fact that just below Queen's Park, um, 
Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really referring to Centennial Park, as I said, they're only in the southern part of Centennial Park, but at um, York Road. Some of you might know um, the York Road bushland that's fenced off is a really, really precious bit of habitat called Eastern Suburbs Banksia Scrub, of which there's only maybe one to three percent left of what there was originally. And um, some great bush regeneration is happening. And luckily, the fairy wrens are still there as of this year, which is really good news because it's isolated. Um, question mark in Bondi Junction. They used to be where the nursery was, but the nursery closed down. Don't know if the wren's still around. Um, other areas, of course, you know, this is where I mentioned before. Anyone, some of you might be saying right now, I live there and you haven't got an icon. I wish I knew. So... You know, if you want to give Vicky that feedback, that you know there are wrens at X address, let me know, please, or, or even a general area. Um, so the question is, once we map them, once we know where they are, we can work to reconnect those areas. And that's a fantastic opportunity. Because if we reconnect it densely, everybody doing a little bit in their own gardens or schools or public land or street frontages may be Despite our urbanisation, we can have both. We can have the biodiversity and the little birds back, as well as having the houses and style of life or the flats that we want. Here's a typical park, no fairy wrens. In fact, other than swallows, no other small birds at all. Now I'm gonna show you three views of sites that do have lots of fairy wrens and other small birds, and you'll see what's different. So, Obviously, it looks different, but what is it about the habitat that's different? So this is in the south end of Centennial Park, near the Allison Roadside, where practically nobody goes. Um, I think it's around the end of July or August, where the beautiful acacia sophore, the big spreading acacias flower, it is gorgeous there. And you walk through, there are fairy wrens, um, New Holland honey eaters, different small birds on migration, even spotted partalotes occasionally in the forest bit near that. What do you notice? The difference isn't just that there's not just grass, but it's that all different layers are present. So from grasses down below, some of them allowed to go to sea, you've got that whole shrub layer, you can't see through it. That's what you want. That's what they need. And you can see big bushes up to trees in the background. You can also see a diversity of colour, shape and form. And that means things are going to flower and fruit at different times. Insects will be attracted at different times. So all year round there's food. Here's another site. This is in the um, East Lakes Golf Course. I think it's called the Lakes Golf Course, um, which also has a fabulous lot of bush regeneration going on. East and some of the banks you scrub. Um, again, you've got grasses in the foreground, beautiful flowering acacias, and then eucalypts in the background, and there's a whole other dense layer here. Um, naturally, the leaves fall, that forms natural mulch below, and all sorts of invertebrates and fungi and everything will help all of that material decompose and return to the soil as nutrients for more plants. And here's one that I'm sure is familiar to lots of you on the coastal walk. In fact, maybe some of you are walking right there on the path at the background. If you look carefully on the left, right on the cliff edge, there's actually a woolly wagtail sitting next to the pool of water. So what are the characteristics here? The same thing, it's low and dense, so it doesn't really have that tall and bush, uh, tree layer, but there's a variety of species, variety of color, shape and form. Fresh water, because this was after rain, but even when it's not raining, some of these are very, you'll be familiar, very boggy areas. They're sort of raised swamp, swampy areas. So they've got their fresh water and the fresh water is near bushes. So if there's danger, they can escape back into the bushes. The other thing you'll notice here is that it's connected. It's pretty well continuous right along the cliff edge. And we can't always see it because in parts, some of our cliffs, are so vertical that it's just hanging off the vertical edge and we can hardly look over the fence to see it. Um, but that's the other important thing, connectivity, so that they can go between habitats and between families, find their other mates, whatever, have their territorial battles and move if they have to. And interestingly, if you were to turn to the right, you've got Calga Reserve, which is a tiny little park at the top of the Brunty Cutting. Um, 
And even though some of the small birds come there, it's predominantly new, uh, noisy miners uh, and, and magpies and others, but noisy miners rule that top of the park. They do not come down here. So it's really interesting, whether it's because it's the cliff edge or whether it's because well, we know that noisy miners do not like it where there's dense habitat. So there's a double, a double difference. If you plant the dense habitat, you're helping the small ones by giving them shelter, food, etc. But you're also preventing the noisy miners from coming because they don't like it. Okay, so how can we recreate these elements? I've mentioned them, continuous dense cover, layering from grasses to small bushes to trees, diversity to provide food all year round, Particularly, I'm focusing on insect attracting plants because there are so many big nectar plants around already. Please include spiky plants for shelter, clean fresh water, logs, mulch, rocks, etc., for sheltering the invertebrates and connecting. Um, here's a really nice graphic. I think um, Vicky sent you a whole lot of links, and this is one of them. And it just gives you some ideas of where the spiky plants could go in relation to the softer plants, in relation to the lower plants depending on if it's a, uh, a garden for kids to run around in or something you want to be a barrier or a corner or you're just in filling with other plants. It's actually in one image, it's actually got a lot of information in here. So if we're going to plant, you can go to a nursery and every pot that's, you know, sort of 10, what are they, 10 to 9 centimetres across or something is maybe $10 or more. And you can very, very quickly spend a lot of money and some of those are not going to survive. So that's a massive investment and it may or may not work. And we all want a quick return and we want big things, but actually the best you can do is to buy the tiny little tube stock. So if you can see these pots, the little mini, mini pots inside these two trays, they're only about an inch and a bit across. What's that, three centimetres across? Little tiny square tubes. And um, they're only kind of... I don't know, Vicky, how much they are now, but somewhere maybe 2 to $4 each. And you can see the diversity here. So these are all eastern suburbs, local native plants. Um, and inevitably, you might lose a plant or two over hot summer or whatever, but you can put a lot more plants in for a very, very small amount of money and get a great result. So I'm just going to zoom through some of the possible plants. Um, starting from the ground up. Now, not all of them are going to suit all of your growing types. You've got special challenging sites that might be wet or shady or dampy or boggy or frontal coastal. So I'll just try and race through a few, but before you choose your own ones, please do check what their growing needs are. So the native violet is a fabulous, colourful, beautiful ground cover, normally likes really damp places. Although I saw it growing at the top of Bronte Cutting where it was just sheltered from the sea wind by one tree thriving. So kidney weed is another one. Um, it's a fabulous ground cover. In fact, some people use it instead of a lawn in areas that are not heavily trafficked and it's beautiful. And lizards will, you know, insects and lizards will be great under all of these. And with the glorious name of pig face, I don't know why, <laughs> but um, on the coastal fringe, I'm sure you've seen that. And this is, of course, a frontline coastal, very, very tolerant plant. And if you have a bit of a wall, it looks fabulous cascading down or it can scramble across. Um, and the, the flowers, when you look down on them, are beautiful as well with pale centres. So now some of the grasses, I'm just going to mention three. Um, there's a beautiful plume grass, Dicolacne, um, has these graceful waving heads that just wave in the breeze. Some of them even have a bit of a pinkish tinge. Kangaroo grass is very, very sculptural. This one doesn't show it as much, but the heads are quite... Um, triangular and spiky looking. It's very stunning. And weeping grass or microlina grows vivid green. Um, again, some people try it as a lawn, not for heavy traffic, but um, if it's lightly trafficked, it could be a successful lawn. It stays green all year round. It's pretty drought tolerant. And again, if you allow the tops to go to seed and you might want to mow some bits and leave others, that's fabulous for the wildlife. Then we're going up to slightly higher ones, so maybe clumping ones. You see a lot of the Lomandra, which I mentioned before. This one comes with free frogs. If you look inside the, the little second image I put up there, can you see two tiny little frogs in the middle? 
they're the dwarf eastern, uh, what are they called, eastern dwarf tree frogs. Um, that was actually at Ramwick Environment Park. In the Lamandras, these frogs love it. After rain, they'll come out and go crazy croaking the tiny croaks. The Dianella, I haven't really got the leaves showing here, but they've got these beautiful purple flowers, followed by purple berries. Comes with a free Eastern Rosella. This one was in Centennial Park, would you believe? So our Rosellas used to be more common until rainbow lorikeets came into Sydney. So again, about 30 something years ago, the rainbow lorikeets that we see around all the time weren't the dominant big colorful parrot at all. They were pretty unusual. And it was the Eastern and Crimson Rosellas that you might see, not big numbers, that they've now been pretty well out outcompeted by the lorikeets and others. So that was a real bonus. And beautiful flannel flowers, maybe in drier, drier country. Gorgeous. Um, so now we're going to the bushes. We've got the coastal rosemary, Westringia. This one comes with a free fairy wren, <laughs> um, showing off its blue tail in winter. Um, and again, yes, yeah, so the Westringia, the coast rosemary, forms quite a dense bush. A lot of the native bushes really respond well to tip pruning. So rather than a great big, you know, cutting with shears, although you can do that if you want to, of course, um, in the natural habitat, cat and all sorts of larvae would be nibbling on them and then they would just get healthier and greener tips and, and stay a bit more compact and bushy rather than quite spindly. So a lot of people just do gentle tip pruning to their endemic plants. Many of them respond well. And it, it is really great shelter. Um, acacias, so this is uh, prickly moses, acacia ulicifolia. It's got smaller prickles. They're not really, you know, drastically spiky, but it's a lot of them. And when it's got a dense form, it is such a great protective bush. And as for the acacias, you know, from tiny little ones like this, well, they, they get quite big, but I mean, from tiny acacias to huge trees, you can't have too many acacias. They're going to be flowering at different times. And if you plant several species, you're likely to have colour and shape and, of course, attract insects and birds for many, many, many months. There's this slender rice flower is a very, very low plant um, and attracts butterflies, so particularly. So that's another lovely one to plant. Um, and for the small nectar feeders, um, there's this corio, corio albae or white corio. Um, it doesn't have such a tubular flower. There's another one which is similar to this that has a beautiful long red and green tube. So again, the small honey eaters like Eastern Spinebill and some of the others would be able to insert their beak and get the nectar out of that one. Um, the tea trees, again, I don't think you can have too many tea trees. The full frontline coastal one um, is amazing. It's a wonderful plant, but you need a big, big property for that. So you'll be able to see that if you go on any of the coastal walks, um, you know, they grow beautifully, fabulous habitat, but it might be too big for most backyards. This one's a, a form of Leptospermum flavescens, which um, I know you can get from the community nursery. It actually does really well in pots. So that's another thing I wanted to mention. Quite a lot of these do well in pots. And if you don't have a garden, um, you might be in an apartment or you might just have a little um, patio with hard surfaces. There is so much you can grow in pots and you can still have that layering effect that, that you know, we're, we're talking about. Uh, and even if the birds take their time coming or don't come, you'll be doing great things for the insects. So leptospermums are wonderful and there are many, many forms. The grevilleas, remember I mentioned before about the hybrid grevilleas that are big and showy and flower all year round and they're terrific for the noisy miners and not good for the rest because they'll be chased. But we've got quite a lot of beautiful, tiny, delicate grevilleas um, native to the Sydney region. And this is just two of them. Um, they don't flower all year round. They might have a, they'll have a shorter flowering season. They're much smaller and more subtle. But if you like them, you could group a few together and have in the end a lovely patch of each colour as it flowers. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm not saying the noisy miners won't come. They would probably love to if they could. But because it's not as reliable of a source of nectar all year round, um, they probably won't defend that patch as aggressively. And so the little honey eaters and, the, and all the insects that pollinate as well will have a better chance. 
there's this beautiful crowia, um, which at the moment is flowering, um, I think, I don't know about South Head, but Nielsen Park for sure up the top and um, other places. Crowia is a lovely plant and I've seen quite a few different insects on it. And this Darwinia is an unusual little plant. The flowers start off white and then they turn red. So every bush will have a mixture of reds and whites and this bright green and it's very lovely, very small bush. Uh, moving to the bigger ones, medium and tall. Uh, this one has the lovely name of bracelet honey myrtle, uh, Melaleuca armillaris. So again, this is a frontline coastal plant. It's almost like it can be a small tree uh, or a tall bush. You can see how profuse uh, the, the um, blossoms can be in season and that's fantastic for insects, birds, shells and works. Now this one hasn't got such a nice name, tick bush. I don't know why because it doesn't bring ticks but it's called Kunzia, the other name, Kunzia ambigua um, and that's the one I mentioned before. So the flowers are teeny but very beautifully scented as is this one. So in the earlier photo, the second habitat, Wren habitat photo, <coughs> excuse me, I had this one as well, Acacia Swabi Olens. So the cut, it's not brilliant yellow like some wattles. Um, it's quite a subtle whitish yellow. Uh, it's a fairly sparse plant, but again, the, the scent is just heavenly. And that's a lovely one to put maybe near your entrance or near the favorite spot out the back where you sit, um, because you'll just enjoy that scent when it flowers. Now here's a fabulous habitat plant, Dagger Hakea really long spiky uh, leaves. This is not one that you would plant in the main kid playing area, <laughs> but if you have a back corner or a section that's really not that accessible up against the fence, um, or if you have a bigger area and you're just happy to put it, you know, put a whole section away, this is so good. Again, it's got beautiful little flowers. They have nectar, they attract insects and so on, but those daggers, uh, really, really can keep the predators away. And there's another one as well, um, Hekia gibosa, which is in the area. And I'm not really focusing on trees. Obviously, we've got so many gorgeous eucalypts and others <coughs> in that area. But we do have a lot of trees generally, a lot of street trees and so on. And the noisy miners are doing really well. A lot of the other big birds we know, but we know that what the smaller birds need is the low dense habitat. So I really just mentioned a couple here. One is Acacia terminalis, which is this um, sunshine wattle. It has what's called bipinnate leaves. So the leaves divide and divide, um, and they look kind of quite feathery. Um, and it seems in research that's been done on noisy miners in uh, uh, corridors in, you know, in the countryside where people are recreating corridors by roadsides and so on, trying to get habitat and working out what to plant. Where they found a high proportion of bipinnate leaved acacias were mixed in with eucalypts, etc. there were far fewer noisy miners, which was really interesting. And, you know, they're, what, they're amazing birds, don't get me wrong, they're fascinating, fabulous birds, but there are too many of them and we know what they're doing to the others. So the other one here is the shrubby she oak, Allocasurina distilla. So it's a, it's quite a low casuarina um, and the flowers are quite interesting. So they're called she oaks, but some of them should be called he oaks because interestingly, they have the male flowers only on a male tree and the female flowers only on a female tree. Um, and so some of them are she oaks and some of them are he oaks. And this is what the she oak flowers look like. Beautiful little red spikes. And then the males are sort of long, I haven't got a picture, but they're long whitish yellowish cascady. Um, uh, pendulous things and uh, that's a really good habitat one and then they have these beautiful cones afterwards I think you can see the cones in the first picture just up there so that is the she oak because she's got the cones uh, and of course different cockatoos love cracking those open uh, so now climbers and scramblers so once we've done this what have we done we've gone from the ground from the ground covers to the grasses the little bushes the medium bushes the tall bushes the small trees now we can fill it all in with some beautiful creepers and vines and again that enriches the whole shelter height color and interest now the first one I've got is the guinea flower so that actually can be a scrambler in fact I sort of could have put that with the ground covers at the beginning 
um, because that really can be spreading and wonderful. Then um, clematis uh, is a beautiful old man's beard. And right here, you've got a free hoverfly coming along. Can you see on the lower right next to the white flowers, there's a beautiful little hoverfly just coming to pollinate. Appleberry is a very, very delicate sort of twiner, quite beautiful. And the Hardenberger, the false sarsaparilla, gives the most wonderful display. In fact, mine are just opening up today um, or this week. Uh, it's a short flowering period, but absolutely beautiful. Now, there are other habitat elements that are really, really important. So we mentioned some of them earlier. And here are some logs and mulch. So the log on the lower right, if you can look closely, you'll see all these little channels and holes. So I think the beetles probably shelter, sheltered in the hole that you can see in the middle of it and came out and tunneled under the bark before the bark fell. And there've been amazing research studies um, near Canberra actually, so it's a different environment, true, but they were looking at the same habitat with logs and without logs, looking at the invertebrates. And they were also comparing logs with the bark left on as opposed to logs without the bark. And the more logs, the better for the invertebrate, not only that, but soil, moisture, all sorts of things. And, um, uh, and with the bark on, again, it gave much more habitat. Mulch, logs, rocks and water. So water, we can do bird baths. You can buy very, very fancy bird baths or make the simplest one out of the simplest pot base. As long as you can clean it, you need clean water, you need to clean it regularly, not with any chemicals, just maybe just with a bit of a brush and definitely clean water as often as you can because the birds might do droppings in it and spread any disease. Um, so a friend of mine um, has this wonderful couple of different bird bars, but she's got superb fairy wrens, little silver eyes come, and these New Holland honey eaters. Look at them having an amazing time. Um, the New Holland honey eater photo actually shows some of the other elements. So in the background, can you see Lamandra <coughs> on the right? So she's got shelter with they can escape back into the minute there's danger. But also on one side, it's really good if there's an open view. So they can see, uh, you know, they can see a way out, they can see danger coming. Um, and, uh, and a great big log there as well, which we just talked about how wonderful the log habitat is. You may have enough room and want to actually make a pond in the ground. And there are many ways of doing that, either with a liner or a ready form, and then just basically hide it with rocks. If you can get a recirculating pump, that would be great. Now, not everyone has the space, but if you do, of course, that could benefit frogs as well. And all the different insects will come and start breeding in summer. And then you've got a whole pond ecology. Um, <coughs> you can see other elements here, like the rocks. So little tumbled piles of rocks are also great homes for lizards. Um, and yeah, so it goes on, the biodiversity just keeps getting better and better. Um, and the same one, if you see the rock at the back of the previous slide, this zoomed in, uh, this was not in Sydney, I have to say, but still, 11 little silver eyes on migration stopped here. And they didn't go into the big pond. They loved the different little sheltered bits just where the water was cascading down. And that's a constructed pond. That was only a few years after it was constructed. So on the left, can you see that garden? Have a really good look at this garden on the left, please. There's a bit of a pond, there's a dragonfly sculpture. And in the back, can you see something like a great big, I don't know, olive or something, maybe some acacias, some hanging baskets. It looks huge, doesn't it? It's really a small compact garden, seven and a half meters long. And um, this is Judy Christie's garden in the inner west. And um, she's lovingly brought this to life over many, many years. And I wish I had a, a photo of the next bit on the right, because on the right hand side, it's very, very shady. And I think damper as well, maybe separate to the shade, but also just drainage wise. And if you turn to the right there, it's like a rainforest. If you sit down low, you'd believe you were in a rainforest. Um, and so this is just to show that, you know, the many possibilities of the sorts of gardens or <coughs> balconies that everybody has, don't be phased. You can create habitat no matter how big or how small or how dry or how ocean exposed your garden is. 
all of these wonderful creatures that I've got down here on the right will start coming and the birds will respond as well. So here are some of the things just to reiterate. Create new habitat in a bare area. If you've got any plants, it's actually really good not to rip out things unless for any other reason you need to or it's a really damaging thing. But try and infill between, below, between and through them and layers, layers, layers. Focus on insect attracting plants particularly. Um, water, mulch, logs, stones. I didn't mention the insect hotels, <clears throat> but it's a nice name for little uh, people make them out of wood or out of clay or out of little bamboo tubes because a lot of the native bees need um, little hollows and holes to either dig in or go in and nest in and so on. Um, and of course, um, my friend Judy, whose garden that was just there, the small garden that was so beautiful, um, she also has native bees. You can actually buy a native beehive. They're stingless and there's very little maintenance and they'll help pollinate everything you're trying to grow, especially if you've got a veggie garden. You know, it's just wonderful what you can do. Create corridors by inspiring your neighbours. So if you might create a fabulous habitat and if one other neighbour does it, it's more than twice the impact across the fence. And then if they inspire the next people and then there's a school garden that does the same, honestly, we can reconnect all those little fairy wren and, and other spots um, have, a, have a great, you know, effect. Uh, the Birds in Backyards website uh, I've got up there, it's got so much information about identification, habitat creation, um, hollows if you want to set up artificial um, hollows. I haven't gone into that a lot here because the only small species that might actually benefit from a hollow might be the spotted pardalote, although they usually prefer to nest in a slopey bank or a, a pile of you know dirt that you've left off in a corner and thought it was a bit of rubbish it might be their perfect nesting site. Um, but hollows are really important for many of our um, birds and uh, larger birds. And um, anyway, sit back and enjoy the beauty and diversity you've created. Hopefully you'll be inspired to also monitor and record um, and maybe photograph from a fixed spot, which is wonderful. And then you've created the habitat and the birds will come and you'll be able to enjoy it. So um, just wondering if you have any questions. <laughs> Over to Vicky. Oh, she left camera, the big camera's there. Vic, we can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Do away with our phones. Um, there's been a couple of questions, Renee, as we were going, and I did my best to ask, answer them. Um, one was about shade tolerant plants. Um, can you suggest any plants that would do well under a canopy? Yes, so quite a few of the ones that I mentioned. As I said, I can't, couldn't go into all the detail here, but um, you know, for example, the, the native violets right at the very beginning. Uh, I didn't even put pictures of the ferns, but of course, if you've got maidenhair fern and the other beautiful soft low ferns, um, if you've got room for tree ferns, that's wonderful, but they're a bit of an investment. And there are so many uh, damp and boggy, some of the grevilleas, uh, some of the others, um, uh, so I'm just trying to think. Oh yes, there is a list. I think Vicky, it might be among the links you sent to people that actually says the moisture requirements for different plants. So um, please do have. I know a... it's on habitat stepping stones. It says the requirements and what type of okay. planting conditions they need as well. So yeah, we yeah. can find it on there. We're also having a bit of a discussion about bird baths and why you need to clean a bird bath if in nature water doesn't get cleaned. Yeah, that's interesting. I suppose often it's um, either a puddle that's temporary and dries up or if it's a flowing creek or stream, it would be naturally cleaned. Um, I suppose where we put a bird bath, if it's successful and it's adopted by lots of birds, they'll be doing their droppings in it, many species will be coming and bacteria might spread because it is such a small and limited environment. Um, and as well as that, if you, it's great if you can just easily tip it out <laughs> uh, and refill it. Uh, over summer, then you, you won't have the mosquito larvae breeding. It's the other thing. So it's, um, it's a really good thing you can do. Uh, 
Um, somebody's just saying that their currawongs wash their worms in their bird bath. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> wow, could you get a photo? That would be so good. I've never actually seen that. Um, okay, so I just wanted to uh, to flag, so Bronte and Renee, maybe you could stop sharing your screen yep. for a moment now and we could get the um, videos up again. Yep. Okay. Um, if, if you live in the Bronte and Tamarama area, Waverley Council are running a programme called Living Connections and we can come to your garden and give you advice about creating small bird habitat and some free seedlings. So please get in contact with me. Um, I sent the email out to you earlier today, so you have my email details. Um, if you're not in the Bronte and Tamarama area, you can go to Habitat Stepping Stones. It's a, a website which lists, uh, it lists suitable habitat plants and it helps you plan your garden because it's set out in terms of, as Renee did, like low plants, medium plants, and tall plants, and which ones provide food and shelter. Um, <clears throat> So if you live in the Waverley area, you can click when it, at the top, it'll ask you where you are. So click Waverley and it will produce just the plants that are suitable for our area. Um, so, and also during the presentation, Renee mentioned bird data when she was talking about um, the data she'd collected and the sightings of birds. So we really encourage you to hop onto bird data and start logging if you've seen the birds. And we'd really be interested to know about superb fairy wren sightings can I, sorry, can I just mention it, about that, that, um, that Holly uh, from Birds in Backyards, they're actually running two workshops, come, uh, webinars coming up right now. So the 1st of July and the 5th of July on how to use bird data. So the timing might be perfect. If any of you are inspired, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that sounds good. Are there any other questions? Let me just have a look at chat. There's a few things come up in chat. Um, somebody's saying that Randwick Council also do a gardening on the wild side workshop series. Um, can I can I just say in the meantime? No, just just stop me if you've got something else. But um, more often you'll probably see me like this. <laughs> out in the field <laughs> looking with the binoculars so if you see a you know strange person on on the coastal walk it could be me um but i also guide field uh, field trips and of course i hope that really really soon we'll be able to do that again and i would love to take you all on a field adventure and see what we can find because um you know we really are lucky with our being surrounded by such beautiful natural places and um hopefully if you can bring them back and also if you can quietly just try and tune in so you know the coastal walk so a lot of you will be much younger than me and you're probably joggers on the coastal walk or you know really fast walk and so on bird watchers we go very slow it's not very good for health wise but if you do race along tracks and things maybe just sometimes um listen and stop and pause because you might suddenly realise that you're hearing all these amazing sounds, the tiny frogs and the crickets and the birds and, and the small and difficult to see ones. Um, and then you'll start to realise that there'll be certain spots where you notice them every time and you notice not just one but two because it turns out where the fairy rings are is often where the little honey eaters are, which is often where something else is, which is, you know, like in that first picture with the wrens and the willy wagtail together. So perhaps it's safety in numbers as well as where the good food is. And so I hope to all meet you out in the field one day and share an adventure. Thank you, Renee. It was a really great presentation. It was really interesting. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, I'll, we'll leave it there this evening. I'll just, there's a couple of other questions. So I'll just finish answering those. Um, so if you want to just hang around if you have a question, but we'll wait on. But um, can everybody else? Good evening, enjoy your night. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.